So welcome everybody to our first uh, cover crop virtual farm tour with Mike and Mark Jackson from Oskaloosa, Iowa. I hope that I'm live streaming okay. We're just trying to figure this all out. So thanks for being patient with us. We're gonna have a video today of Mike and Mark out in the field. Um, and so I just wanted to welcome everybody. This is Sarah Carlson from Practical Farmers of Iowa. Um, of course, we would normally love to do these field days face to face, but considering the circumstances, we're gonna make it work virtually. Uh, Maggie, you wanna go to the next slide? So before I, I turn it over uh, to the Jacksons who are in the field on site, um, I just wanted to make sure that folks know about some programs that we offer for those getting started with cover crops. Uh, we offer a cover crop cost share program and that is open and we are actively taking signups. Um, on the slide there uh, that will be coming up in a little bit, you'll see that it's a bit.ly link slash cover crop cost share. Um, and so if you are selling to the ADM supply chain out of the Des Moines uh, Central Iowa facility or cooperating co-ops, or if you're selling corn directly to the Cargill facility at Eddyville, Iowa, you are eligible for this cost share. The Jacksons uh, take advantage of those cost shares. And uh, we hope that that helps uh, get more people trying cover crops in the future. It's $10 an acre and um, you need to attend a learning event, which this virtual uh, field day would can be considered counted for that. Um, and then PFI uh, membership is also is also offered. Next slide. So as I said, uh, we would love to be doing this face-to-face. -face. Here's a picture of the, the Jackson's uh, field day last fall and the folks that were, uh, were out in the field when he, he was getting ready to be planting cover crops. Um, and so it was nice uh, that we could all get together last fall, um, but we're going to do this virtually today. And then last slide. And so Mike's going to talk about today a number of different issues. Um, take a walk across the farmyard and, and visit some fields. And so he'll go over those, those goals for cover crops and why they're using them on their farm, what the cover crops are looking like right now in uh, central southeast Iowa-ish, um, what his corn planter setup is looking like and the fertility and herbicide programs he's going to be thinking about here in the next couple weeks as corn planting gets rolling. Uh, and then also talk about, you know, should we be choosing complex cover crops or just stick with some simple solutions like a cereal rye? What's the best way to make that decision? And then of course, go over some fall planting methods for cover crops uh, when we wanna get started. So those aren't in any specific order. Mike's gonna uh, take us on this journey today. And so I'm happy to hand it over to the Jacksons who are on site. And so if you guys wanna start and introduce yourself, we're ready. Hello, I'm, um, it's my turn. Yep. Okay. Hello, I'm Michael Jackson. My father, Mark. We're uh, I'm a sixth generation family farmer. He's fifth generation here in Mass County, South Central Iowa. Um, it's a blustery 50 degrees with a pretty good breeze. So you guys should be grateful you're inside where it's warm because it's kind of chilly out here right now. But, uh, the picture earlier that Sarah showed, I'll flip the camera around. I can show you what it looks like right now. So here is the same rye field that we were playing in last uh, November 22nd, 23rd, somewhere in there. I had my cover crop field day as I was finishing up planting cereal rye. Um, the spring has been pretty, pretty nice to us. Things have warmed up and got some nice rains. Uh, got a beautiful snow the other day, gave us some kind of some free nitrogen, if you will. That's really made the cover crops come to life. We'll kind of give you a, there we go. There's the first earthworm of the year. Hardly. They're everywhere. But it's about the soil structure, it's kind of got that cottage cheese or that coffee grounds crumble. That's what things will look like after you've been no-tilling for several years. And then to add cover crops on top of it is kind of like putting um, frosting on top of your cupcakes. So as Sarah mentioned, we'll kind of walk through this. And if you guys have any questions, just go ahead and drop them in the comments box. We'll, uh, we'll try to answer them as timely as possible. There is a little bit of a delay, a little bit of a drop, um, a 15 second 
drag, if you will, but I'll flip the camera back around. A little easier for me anyway. So, um, like I said, we've been doing no-till corn and beans since all oh, early 80s, Dad. Um, yeah. And so the big reason that we've been doing that is we're trying to alleviate soil erosion, um, increase our soil uh, holding capabilities. So you're increasing your organic material by not destroying it or not um, trying to bury that residue and releasing the carbon out of the soil. Uh, we have a fair amount of not EGL land. So we well, what dad, uh, to, to summarize what dad was saying is we live here between the North and the South Skunk River. And so we have a lot of HEL ground. And so that was the main reason to going into no-till in the first place. Um, and then, like I said earlier, cover crops is just kind of a icing on the cupcakes, if you will. Um, it's, I think what we're gonna kind of speed this up and walk towards the machine shed so I can get rid of this headset and you can hear both dad and I get a lot more information out of this, so. Um, let's I got a question from the, from the comment box though. People wanna know when you drilled that rye. So this rye was drilled towards the end of September. Um, first of October, we took part of the end rows off the field. I'll just stop and pan this back. Great. The rest of the field, you can kind of see there is a little bit of a distinction where the rest of the field didn't get harvested. That actually got snowed on twice before we got the corn off. But you can see the end rows are nice and green. And then you can kind of my finger's not getting in the way, but you can see the, the color differentiation. But with my field day last November, I had to make sure I had some good green to show everybody. So that's why we're show, showcasing this again. The last couple how many, of springs and, oh, sorry. How many inches of growth do you think you have on the green field in the foreground here? Oh, uh, I think we measured it yesterday and we were close to, um, we were looking at three to four inches. How tall is that rye there by your hand, Dad? Yeah, Look we're at, running, running around three, four inches. It's just been a Great cool, cool spring. Slowing, strong plant, but just a slow growing plant. It's, we use, predominantly use rye because it's, it's kind of like planting soybeans. It's kind of hard to screw it up. It's a very hardy plant for this part of the, Part of the countryside um, and then using like I said the drill so we're trying to trying to get as much growth as we can there's your there's what we're looking for right there we got surface growth for given that it's March looks great yep so I we're gonna start walking over towards the shop okay Keep those questions coming into the comment box and we'll pass them on to Mike and Mark. Yeah, it makes it easier for us if you guys tell us what you want to hear. <laughs> Otherwise, we're just going to be out here rambling on. So, I mean, some of the benefits of doing cover crops is you get some um, nutrient banking, increased rodent, or erosion control. Um, and then depending on the amount of cover you end up with, you do get some weed suppression. And when you start getting healthy soils like that, you get better water infiltration in shorter periods of time. I mean, this past spring, we had significant rainfalls in the month of May, and we didn't have as much erosion as some of our neighbors that do full tillage. I'm not saying that full tillage is not, not, the, um, not bad, but there's, there's multiple tools in the farmer's toolbox today. The cereal rice should be one of them. Um, is there any other questions that have popped up, Sarah? Not so far, doing a good job. Okay. All right, we're just about to the machine shed. We're gonna look at the corn planter here. So, you can kind of bear with me. I'm going to turn my headset off and see if I can get the speakerphone to come on. So we did have a question again about uh, the fall planting date 
And so I'll just yep. repeat it. Uh, the field we were, that you guys were just in, you'd planted at the end of September. And then uh, most of your other fields though were post harvest late, like after some snow, right? Uh, large majority. So the, the last stop we'll make on this virtual farm tour is the shop where our, our grain drill is. We have a 40 foot John Deere air seeder that I used to chase dad in the combine. Um, so yeah, we don't fly a whole lot on. There's a couple of farms that we will work with depending on the year and the amount of biomass we're trying to get off of it. We've tried, we've tried aerial seeding several different years, several different occasions, and it's just conducive to how good a moisture is in the fall, that sort of thing. So we struggle with getting good placement of, uh, of the seed stand. So then, then with that struggle, we try to stay away from. And so that's where we got started into the, to the drill scenario. And having worked with people such as Steve Berger, who kind of mentored us going into this, there is no late time to be drilling. Um, so we'll, we'll go right after Thanksgiving into December drilling as long as the soil allows us to, to uh, make seed to soil contact. That seed will lay there all winter and grow. If it doesn't grow this uh, in the fall, it'll germinate come spring. Great, I'm gonna ask you one more um, question and before we pivot to the planter, sorry. Are you using covers on all your acres or just certain fields in certain situations? Our goal is 100% coverage, cover crops on our acres. Occasionally you make that decision then uh, last year where we had uh, a late soybean harvest on a few fields, knowing that you're not gonna get much fall growth on a soybean field going to corn for next year, uh, especially if you got an early, you know, April, mid-April planting date, you're not gaining a lot. So you make that choice, uh, you know, field by field and year by year. And like dad, tried to say earlier you guys may not have heard it the some of the HEL ground that we have it's more susceptible so putting that root mass in the ground will really help cut down on the erosion so those are always priority one to get on um, the other thing we've been experimenting with is drill, drilling our cereal rye ahead of the manure application or after uh, we apply in somewhere between five six hundred acres of hog manure every year and so that's another obstacle to overcome in the fall not only a wet fall but trying to get everything applied timely and get everything to come up and do what it's supposed to do well the obstacle of the manure combination drilling do we do it or don't we do it is your, your concern is if it's going to be dry enough when you're out there putting the manure on that you don't destroy what you is that early germinating rye so it becomes there again a field by field decision um, Another thing is the rate at which we use uh, later in the year. We, we start out at what, 40 pounds? I'll start at 45 and then run all the way up to 65, 70. Um, I do have a few neighbors that I do some custom, custom drilling for and we'll put on 100 to 110 pounds for forage at their request. Um, but we found we've gotten just as good coverage at 40 pounds early in the season when we're start drilling. And then as the season gets longer, and the temperatures get cooler, then we'll uh, slowly increase that rate of rye uh, per acre up to that uh, roughly a bushel per acre for us, just for you know, just for the purpose of cover crop that's going to be terminated in the spring. So, if there's any more questions, I'm going to turn the camera away, and I got some cover crop sample set here. We can kind of talk about the different seeds used. If you got any questions, Sarah. So, Keep going, you're doing good. Like, like I said, cereal rye, that's our predominant one. So that's what's in the bucket right here. Um, I'll also do a little bit earlier on. It's not a great sample of radishes, but this is radish seed. And then depending on the amount of time you have, there's some clover so you can get a little bit of nitrogen fixation. But clover is a very slow, slow growing plant. So like I said, the rye is could predominantly what we work for use because it's so hardy plant. You might sell more of the sorcery rye, that sort of thing too. Um, that cereal rye, I, not to, uh, not to kind of blow my own horn, but we do have our own seed business. We work with Iowa Cover Crops and we predominantly get all of our cereal rye bulk form 
out of the Dakotas area, um, North South Dakota, which we're finding that a cooler climate that grows in, you get a higher germination, seed germination, so you end up with a little better quality stuff. Um, most cereal rye will start growing at 38 degrees. That's why February time frame, where you got just a skip of snow on the ground, but the sun comes out and it gets warm, and you think, hey, spring's around the corner. You look out at those rye fields and they turn nice and bright green, kind of gives you a little bit of a cheer up for the winter dundrums. We make sure the rye as we source it, they may be bulk rye coming out of the Dakotas, but we, you know, it's guaranteed germination, uh, good quality, clean seed. We use an air seeder, so you do need clean seed because any little uh, chaff and one thing can actually bollocks up that air system. If you've got a manic mechanical drive system, that would be a, a less of a concern. So more like your crust buster or um, other other types. I can't speak. I know some guys have used a Kinsey corn planter, like we have here in the background. So it's a this is a 1631 Kinsey, 15 inch. Um, we use it to plant all of our corn, and then we use it if I'm not done. But the beauty of owning that drill is I can start planting soybeans while Dad's still planting corn. And so we can get a little bit quicker start on things, so then we can get everything started a little sooner, hopefully get harvesting a little sooner. Um, that's just a beauty that works on our farm. I discussed about how some people have converted these uh, trend lines to, to using cover crops to save the cost of, of getting in with the drill that you may not normally want to. Yeah, so this is a plate, a vacuum plate planter, and then you can get different plates for it. So you, you could um, plant your cereal rye with this. I have friends that do it on just the 30 inch mark. And I also know people that do it 15 inch spacings. So, I mean, any cover is better than no cover. I think there's a lot of management uh, conversations going on. If you do a 30 inch row, uh, for example, and you let that rye get a little taller, you can actually go in and plant your, your crop in between your rye row to reduce the amount of uh, residue you have to work over, the germination, uh, getting to the sunlight just a, a, you know, a few days sooner, things like that where people are trying to be creative. And, but that's usually down the road a ways after you've had, a, had the opportunity, you know, three to five years. So if you guys have any questions, just go ahead and ask. ask. I got a question here. Do you have a favorite rye variety or typically using VNS, do you think? We use predominantly VNS. I do some experiment with, uh, with well, you guys, practical farmers, Iowa Soybean Association on Farm Network, where we use the Elbon rye. Um, you get a little bit more growth out of the Elbon, the more the hybrid rye compared to the VNS, where it'll get, the last couple of years for us, it's gotten what I call belt buckle deep. I'm not exactly the tallest guy in the world, so some guys may say it's not that deep, but three foot for now. So, um, any All other right, let's pivot there? to spring stuff. Let's pivot All to right. the spring stuff with your corn planter. We got fertilizer questions and herbicide termination questions coming in. So our planter, give you a little bit of a planter setup. Hopefully I don't start to lose you guys here, but uh, we're going to tell a little story of what we learned. So... There's nothing overly fancy about our corn planter. We have the, the spike wheels, closing wheels, and then we have a seed firmer down here that we do about six gallons of the acre in furrow with the Keaton seed firmer, liquid uh, pop-up starter fertilizer. Um, I use 100% ortho. I don't use, the, there's some products out there where you, you have a 80-20 blend, 20% um, ortho, which is immediately available and 80% polymer so you get some plastic in there to kind of get to suspend and and give you another two weeks. The, the goal for the starter for us is it allows us to plant green on green with our corn uh, you know if it's less than a, a foot tall the rye is less than a foot tall when you plant we, we, we're comfortable with that in furl uh, pop-up starter to help offset that early germination concern Oh, I lost you. Okay, I'm gonna have you leave the meeting and okay. go step on the back on the other side of the the planter, and then we're gonna bring you back here. So while they're 
while they're resetting, we don't, we do know in the shed, we have a little area where it drops. Um, they're going to go back into that spring planter setup um, and just probably be a little bit away from the planter. And then we're going to go into fertilizers and herbicide terminations. So when you have those questions about those things, um, go ahead and put them in the chat box. And then Mike, if you want to just maybe stay on the planter while you're talking okay. um, and go ahead, we're back on. Is that better? That's great. Yep. So what we were getting leading up to, if you want to grab that press wheel, Dan. Um, one thing we learned when we put the spike closing wheels on, I bought a set of used, I bought 16 used spike closing wheels and come find out. So a factory Kenzie, uh, not being, um, Just factory rubber tire. is a 13 inch diameter and the spike wheels I bought not knowing were 13 inch diameter. So that's why we have two spike wheels, one per one per side on the row. So that's just a little snafu that we encountered. Well, the point being is that if you buy one spike wheel, make sure the spike wheel is a larger it's diameter. A, a 15 than instead of so, 13. So that otherwise the rubber holds the spike wheel up, the opposing spike wheel with the rubber. If they're the same diameter, the rubber will keep the spike out of the ground. But if your spike is taller diameter, then, then you'll get the benefit of the spike wheel. And the spike wheel, a lot of people use for, especially in wet conditions, it helps eliminate that sidewall compaction, smearing, so that the germinating crop, uh, then that corn crop has trouble establishing that good brace, brace root system. And in turn, you'll get a, be a little better seed to soil contact. Um, so do you feel like this is important based on soil moisture conditions or is it just always the thing you need to do when you got covers in your system? Well, I think every field is a little different when it comes to the spike wheel closing and I don't think there's any perfect wheel for the perfect field because the fields vary, uh, moisture vary, that sort of thing. Spike wheel for us is more geared towards just the little damper soils, uh, which happens the tendency when we're early in the spring with corn, things like that. It doesn't affect, uh, you know, putting the seed in the ground if it's dry, that sort of thing. It goes ahead and moves forward. At least uh, we have found that to be our case in our particular uh, management uh, protocols. It's, it's another tool in the toolbox, if you will. There's no one silver bullet. I think every farmer out there knows that, understands that. Um, and then, so then to kind of keep things moving along, we're trying to be courteous to your time, your guys' time here. So. Our covers, we try to keep it simple. We don't get too complicated into the mixes. It takes a little bit more time to grill, build organic material on your farm by doing a, just a straight rye, but it seems to work great for us. I mean, you could you could do something as simple as rye on your ahead of your soybeans, which won't winter kill, and then oats ahead of your corn if you're just getting started. Um, the downside to oats is, unless we have an Indian summer in October, um, you kind of start to lose growing, growing degree days, and then your, your product will die before your oat, your cereal rye. Excuse me, I got too many thoughts going on here. Your oats will end up past dying before uh, you get much growth, much benefit out of them. So one of the stories behind uh, the organic matter in your soils, uh, it's kind of derivative if, uh, you go to the, your fence row and draw a soil sample out of a fence row that's been there since grandpa put the fence. That is kind of a good indicator of where everything was before we started modern agriculture, tilling and that sort of thing. Go into the field then close by and pull sample and compare your organic matters from your fence row versus what's been farmed for 40, 50, 60 years. And then as you grow into the cover crop scenario, watch uh, and the cover crop is all designed to extend that growing season in that soil as long as possible to help sequester more carbon. Uh, and eventually, hopefully, with the no-till uh, and cover crop scenario, you can maybe gain 1% of organic matter over a 10-year period. So while we're still on this uh, topic, so if they don't do a winter kill oat, What's your go-to like herbicide program going to corn, like for rye going to corn and fertility? So for, um, I'll kind of turn a little bit because I got the sprayer sitting right here. Perfect. Uh, other than I 
kind of bleached my face out, it looks like, but that doesn't matter. Um, about the only difference we've changed is we've gone a little higher rate on our burn down. So um, 15 to 20 gallon. And then just we're essentially adding Roundup to our herbicide program. Uh, still chasing the chill, chasing the planter. If the rye below pop can height, you start getting above pop can height. I usually try to get ahead of dad with the sprayer and terminate the rye pre-plant, um, just because that rye is a rapidly growing plant. As I've been saying all along, it's pretty tough to screw it up, so it can also get away from you too if you're not careful. Um, if you're new to doing it, I would say to start off six eight inches tall maximum height and then grow from there when you get more comfortable. We use a metal ATZ product on our pre-herbicide, um, on our corn, 32 ounces of PowerMax glyphosate, generic glyphosate, however you want to do this. Uh, and then we're using AMS as the carrier for the glyphosate. And then our second, uh, second pass in would be a Callisto product. With, there again with 20 ounces of Power Max and then some AMS again. Um, sometimes we will put a little bit of nitrogen in, like maybe six pounds of the acre to kind of help kill, um, not so much kill, you'll get more of a burning effect on the rye, but you will get terminate the rye and then there'll be enough nitrogen out there to help speed up the breakdown. So then hopefully come, oh, August time frame, that rye will be gone, which will be sequestered back to the cash crop out there to pick up your N and your, your N, P, and K that it had picked up. Any other questions, Sarah? So what about timing of the date? Like, what are you thinking about when it's cold and you're going to go out and try to terminate that rye? So usually I try to follow, um, I call it the 100 rule. So the daytime and the nighttime needs to equal 100. Um, the other thing I watch for is the first 50 degree overnight temperature. Once you get that, I wouldn't pull that too shut, Dad. You might, you might lose ourselves sitting here. Um, get the overnight, overnight temperature um, at 50 or above. Kind of helps get things growing. Um, another thing a, a fellow cover, cover cropper told me was once you've mowed your yard at home, then that rye is growing, and it's you should easily be able to terminate it. But the goal is, is make sure you get a good kill with your uh, with your uh, your glyphosate product if that's what you're using, which is common everyday management in any use of glyphosate on any other product where you're trying to terminate. Just use that good common rule. Like I said, that 100 is a good uh, daytime, nighttime temperature combination. It's 100, you're good to go. We haven't uh, we haven't seen how it works the hundred rule when it's thirty degrees overnight and seventy during the day but um, just some good common sense goes a long ways um, to kind of talk more about our fertility program so we'll put sixty percent of our of our uh, nitrogen up front like I mentioned earlier hog manure or some of the outlying farms will use a uh, dry dry spread like a map dap type product. Um, and then we'll, for nitrogen source, we'll either run 80 to 100 pounds of um, anhydrous, or we use a cargill vetiville product, Angimoto product, uh, byproduct of cargill vetiville, excuse me, which will give you 100 pounds of N, and then a little bit of P and K and some sulfur with there. And then coming second pass, we'll do about 7% of our, our fertilizer with corn planter in the, pop, in the form of pop-up, and, and then do just, a little bit uh, with our first pass herbicide, as I mentioned, the nitrogen in there. And then we'll do a, the final 33% of our nitrogen is in season at uh, V3, V4. When I, usually when I'm out there spraying, I'll have the local co-op come out with their high boy spreader and they'll put on uh, a 40 pound total rate. So you're talking 40 to 50, depending on what tissue samples are. That's another thing is you need to know what you have out there before you just keep adding to it. So soil samples, tissue samples are another great uh, report card for you, if you will. Um, but to get back to what I was saying, 40 pounds is our normal standard, uh, 20 pounds of urea treated with agartane. So you're looking at two weeks release 
and then an ESN product. So you're looking at four weeks, fingers crossed, to get it out to castling time on the corn when you need another shot of nitrogen. Is there any other questions, Sarah? Have you made big changes in that nitrogen program because of cover crops or just because you want to manage nitrogen like better? I think part of the conversation is about the one water conversation. I mean, the, uh, the nutrient uh, water quality initiative that we have in Iowa where we're trying to reduce phosphorus loading in the spring, uh, especially during heavy rain periods, you get the liquid phosphorus and tile water and nitrates, both of those elements are seeming to are seeping out of a, an already organic rich soil. Uh, a lot of that is a mother nature's normal process. The cover crop as a, manages to sequester some of those uh, loose products and puts them in a plant form that can be used later. And I think a lot of that goes to the cover crop effort. Uh, where we're trying to reduce phosphorus loads by 40% and cover crops go a long way towards that just initially uh, and then along with our other means of you know keeping water on the farm so and the soil as well so that we know where our nutrients are um to kind of back up one step we've been cover cropping since uh, about 2012 2013 time frame we've been doing a one quarter three quarters so three quarters of the fertilizer up front and then a quarter um, after planting time frames since 2008 2009 time frame uh, we had some wet years in there where we lost some nitrogen so we had to come out and try to do some rescues on our corn crop so we just kind of got into that more of a spoon feeding approach and we found that it's more effective on our farm no we have 600 acres of, of manure that gets applied every fall so the, you know three-fourths of our corn ground going to corn is, is with the sourcing with the manure uh, product which is under a manure management plan with the Iowa DNR so I think that is a, a part of the factor too where the cover crops come in and help sequester some of those uh, nutrients that are out there waiting to be broke down and help stabilize uh, keep that soil in place I think again all right well, let's take a walk and maybe we can answer a couple more questions while you're headed over to the next shop. Quick little scenario on the so dad, generation. Dad wants to talk about the generations of farming. He's, okay. he's got this great. <laughs> I've got this story I started a few years back. And it's kind of an intriguing thought process given the fact that my grandfather started farming in about 1922. Uh, I, I like to use this farm planner and all this hardware we have up front. Grapple didn't have these, but Grapple started with a two-row planter in 1922. My father started planting, or started farming in 1946. So in essence, we doubled that scenario. I realized then somewhere along the line, I started farming in 1974 with an eight-row planter. Can you still hear him, Sarah? Oh yeah, it's great. To go to the far end at 16 rows, that's where Michael started farming in 2004. It's just a doubling effect of agriculture. You don't realize it until all of a sudden you wake up one day and realize there's four generations indicative in this 16 row planter, which allows, uh, it's kind of an interesting scenario that we are moving forward in agriculture in a positive way. Well, if you guys are ready, we'll walk and talk a little bit more. Um, there again, if you guys have any questions, just feel free to ask them as we as we walk over towards the farm shop. Yeah, so there's a question on, have you ever thought about roller crimping to terminate the rye? And I think you should put the earpiece maybe in your ear because of the wind. Um, have you thought about roller crimping or have you tried it? We have not tried any roller crimping. Um, we do have a set of rollers on the bottom of the corn head to kind of help flatten the corn residue. I probably should have talked about that when we were standing in the, out there in the corn stalks um, to kind of help with the residue management and to kind of help break down uh, the residue we got. Those are two totally different conversations on that head. But as to your original question, uh, Sarah, we have not done the roller crimping in an effort to 
uh, in, in lieu of chemical termination. Uh, that is a, a doable um, you know, scenario. Some people have tried it and got along well with it. Uh, we're still a little reluctant, especially with a lot of resistant weeds floating around in our area. We have a lot of smaller fields, so bringing a big roller in, that sort of thing, timing. Um, it just hasn't been something in our management um, toolbox yet, but I encourage anyone that are welcome to try it, I guess. I know there's multiple applications where they put the roller crimper right on the planting tool, whether it's a corn planter or a soybean planter. You just kind of got to wait a little bit longer. I've been seeing some very encouraging studies of planting your soybeans green and then coming back and rolling it, I believe, at the boot camp they're talking three weeks later. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Sarah. Yep, no, that was right. Okay. Um, and I think the roller crimping is more of an, when you're talking strictly planting soybeans type scenario, for us, we'd be so late, we'd, we'd be uh, beside ourselves trying to wait until uh, mid-June to roller cramp and plant our corn. So this conversation, in my estimation, strictly, uh, you know, a soybean into rye scenario. Uh, first of all, for those that maybe not quite as familiar with the conversation. Um, Great. Well, I'm going to turn it around. So like I mentioned earlier, the, the biggest, the machine we use the most to do our soybeans, our soybeans, Excuse me. The, the machine we use to do a lot of our cover crops and then soybeans is this John Deere 40 foot air seeder. No, I'm not paid by John Deere, so don't hold me back on that one. Um, it seems to work great for us in our application. There again, every farm's different. Every, the, way, the way everybody farms is different. Um, but this part of the conversation, we're gonna kind of talk about um, seeding methods, different options. I mean, there's, there's a, whole, a whole slew of them now. Um, when we first got started into cover crops, drill or airplane was about the two biggest ones. Um, since then, they've added uh, high boy, I think Haggy Manufacturing, Walker Manufacturing has added dry, dry applications to their um, sprayer rigs. Uh, I have some friends that have a Sanford style box on their corn head and they blow the seed out underneath the corn snouts, which you're picking corn and you're seeding. They said the only downside is they only can run for two to two to three acres at a time. Then they got to stop and reload the reload the Sanford box up. So, but the point being is they're able to save twelve to fifteen dollars in their application fee by doing that, uh, short of what their equipment costs to put it on their combine. It's one last pass. It puts it down then, right then and there. It depends on when they're harvesting, obviously, but at least. They can get it out there, get a little residue over it coming out of the combine, and, they, and they've had really good results with that. So I think a lot of it is being creative in your own management skill uh, to decide what it is that you can do to save costs. You know, we, we buy bulk rye and we can save a few dollars in, uh, uh, a bushel that way. So those are, that, that's money that goes to a less expense when it comes to uh, the whole cover crop conversation. And I think that's what it's all about, being creative. And the other thing you can do is you're just your local co-op fertilizer company. You get the dry spreader box from them. Um, work with them on that. That is, don't just go take it from them and not tell them what you're doing because it, it takes time and effort to run everything out across the ground. But I have a handful of customers have used a dry fertilizer spreader, get it set right, and then they'll just come back and lightly harrow or even slightly disc or a vertical till. Vertical turbo till. Uh, yeah, they may even incorporate it with their fertilizer spread too if they're putting down some P and K uh, for fall application. And a lot of times when you work with your co-op and and in advance, they're willing to work with you to help drop that rye in with that fertilizer and spread it all in one one pass. So there are a lot of different opportunities out there to, to get it on without that additional application fee. So I have a question. What if your combine had drill units on it and you were trying to combine drill cover crops at the same time? Just don't back up. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a forward motion. It, it, it's, it depends on how well you want to do what you do. And I think uh, if you put your mind to it, 
some people are already overloaded with just the combine process. So adding that in might be more than one people, some people would want to deal with, but I would encourage anybody the opportunity to, to try your level of management. And uh, I don't think there's any wrong uh, answers uh, to this effort to try to get it on so that it can grow. I guess my question is, do you mount the toolbar underneath the head and, or, or is it trying to pull the drill with the combine? So um, talk to your equipment manufacturer and you might come up with a new idea nobody's thought of yet. What I've heard about with the application with the combine is uh, you really don't need to seed the soil with a, with, a, with a disc tool as much as just putting it down and then the process of the head mulching that stock down as you get that ear into the combine that really then it will cover up that rye that's laying on the ground and hold the moisture in place and you'd be surprised that rye will pop up through there with just a little bit of rain and and germinate and go to town even your residue distribution out the back end with the chopper um just like dad mentioned getting a little bit of organic material on top and then you get a little moisture added to it things i mean rye is a very resilient plant so you have any other questions, Sarah? And this probably is mostly just for that rye window because you're kind of late. So maybe just remind folks, like, what are your cutoffs with the drill, I guess, when you're thinking about those other species? Like, did you drill oats last year for folks? And where would that work? And then when are you putting rye down for folks with that drill? Yeah, so the drill, mid-September, I think, um, there again, work with your local NRCS. They have a great system set up on... Um, whether you're wanting to do oats or barley or your radishes, which are all winter kill, or you do like a white rye or a winter wheat or a triticale, which, which will overwinter, they'll take uh, some significant frost before. Um, the latest I've gone with oats and then had some success was a couple years ago, and I was the middle of October. Um, the one thing about with the drill is you get that seed to soil contact, so you can actually add almost. I say almost two weeks compared to a plane. I would think early October would be the latest I'd want to try to play with oats just for the cost factor and mother nature not knowing her schedule. Um, but I think oats is a good opportunity for anyone that's, for example, chopping silage in the fall where you know, you're out there in August, uh, very early September chopping, you've got that bare soil. Uh, you, know, you can apply manure then or you can put your oats down first and let it go ahead and, and, and grow up. And as it's starting to get some height, then you can take your manure out, spread it over top of the whole scenario. Um, and I've seen guys go out and then and, and use a, a rolling harrow to distribute that manure a little more uniform if it's bedding manure versus a liquid spreader type thing. But that oats then should get a nice foot of growth, give you cover on that bare soil if you chopped and allow that erosion control. Mother Nature will terminate it for you. Come next spring, it'll be down to a nice mat that then you can deal with um, and plant directly into without any, any tillage. All right, I got a few questions coming in. Uh, do you think uh, the allelopathic effect of rye hurts your corn yield at all? Um, there again, we talked about having a pop-up starter in furrow, which will kind of I, I say it kind of bubbles the seed, if you will, because it has everything that seed needs right then and there for the next week and a half as that plant goes and grows through its process and gets through that um, toxicity that the rye can leave behind. There is some truth and some merit to it. You need to work that into your fertilizer program to kind of get a better, um, oh, I lost the direction I was thinking. But, understanding of what it is the chemistry going on below the ground type thing uh, but yeah there's a little bit of a concern i think part of it is overcome with time that three to five year window where we're working into cover crops the, the soil is transitioning the, the biodiversity underground the things you don't see the chemistry is changing um the bacteria that are there kind of help offset a little bit some of that concern Okay, another question. If you had a wet, did you have wet ground last spring or do you predict that you might have wet ground this spring? Are you worried that the covers might delay planting? Actually, we find that it's just the opposite. Yeah, you may have a certain amount of moisture, but a tremendous amount of that moisture that's been lay 
laid out of the sky by mother nature is actually taken up into plant form so it's there it's just in in the plant in, in, a, in a way that actually uh, the plant actually allows you a little extra we we found last year coming off of three weeks of rain through the last half last part of may and into that's murphy playing soccer over here um, <laughs> But the, the rye actually allowed us to kind of tiptoe out early and a few days ahead of anyone who could even till soil. We planted, had no uh, impacts. We, you know, we put some 70 bushel yields in, in the wagon last fall on soybeans. some soybeans in, in mid-July, uh, or June rather. So, you know, I think it's somewhat subjective, but nevertheless, I think um, our experience has been it actually helps enhance the long-term uh, outlook. We, we planted 70% of our soybeans in uh, June 3rd through the 6th time frame this past year. We were able to get out a day earlier. Um, and the, another, um, another hidden beauty of cereal rye is if there's a wet spot out in the field, the rye doesn't grow. So you know to steer clear so we didn't get stuck either. <laughs> Awesome. But, uh, All right, another question. Sorry, what's your goal for, so you said you want to do 100% of your acres and cover crops. Do you feel for yourselves or for neighbors that maybe are just getting started where you guys were, you know, 10 years ago or so, is cost share an important part of that? Or do you think it's more just farmers learning from other farmers to get started? What do you think can help really incentivize this? Well, early those early innovators into the starting cover crop, you know, First of all, start small, you know, whether it's 20 acres, 40 acres, whatever magic number you feel comfortable with, just start small. I recommend starting on uh, soybeans going into corn stalks. I think that's your best opportunity. Uh, some people have done that strictly soybeans going into corn stock ground uh, in an effort to try to get through that early management skill and then go into every acre or at the same acre every year is your goal. Um, if you're in a corn soybean rotation, for example. Okay, no more questions. We got about three or four minutes left. Do you want to show us anything else on the, the drill? Um, I guess to kind of, the only thing that we really did differently on this drill, if I can turn around, there we go. Um, the biggest thing we did different was the size of the gauge wheel. Um, I mean, a normal gauge wheel is, I think, four and a half, five inches. Mm -hmm. So we have the narrower gauge wheels on, on this uh, John Deere air seeder. Other than that, there is not that much difference. Uh, I've been working on it. That's why it's sitting here in the middle of the shop, kind of all dusty, dirty. I need to go through and grease it and then do a few other odds and ends equipment maintenance to it. Uh, just to explain the reason why we put the narrow gauge wheel on, it's because when you get into that rye that's uh, waist high or shoulder high when you're playing soybeans, when you press over that with that wheel, you've actually got a bunch of mulch underneath that uh, press wheel. And a narrow gauge wheel on and sod rye like that then gives you better contact, a, a much more uh, opportunity to have that consistent seed depth. And I, I think what happens with the first thing we found is you need to really sock that drill in the ground uh, to get the proper depth. I mean, you're not going any deeper. The goal is to get where you need to be to begin with. And that magic, you know, at least half inch of soil cover to a, an inch and a half for a soybean. And if you don't do that, it turns off dry, you have seed laying on top of the ground. So it's important to get that seed a little deeper than, than too shallow. Yep, that and in the fall when I'm out in the cornstalk field, that narrow gauge wheel does the same thing. It helps keep that cereal rye in the ground, as Dad mentioned earlier. So if there's no more questions, I think we'll just kind of close it up here. Sounds good. All right. Um, so parting yep. words. I oh, whoop. you just you just left. That's okay. So uh, nope. oh, come on back. Give us some parting words. Go ahead. Thanks, Maggie. Uh, try something. I mean, experiment, start small, work into it, get comfortable, get your legs underneath it. Go find a handful of guys out there that are doing it, like dad or myself, that you can ask questions to. Um, I think words of my grandpa, 
is there are no such things as dumb questions, just stupid answers. And I think give yourself a fair fair chance of three to five years when you start it. Try to try to do three to five years, because uh, we're dealing with a cultural mindset change of uh, coming off of you know the tillage scenario, especially if you're not a no-till person to begin with. Yeah, I mean, it's so easy to get out there and want to till something up. And there's been many a time I've had to resist, resist that urge coming from a family that, you know, uh, tillage was, was the only right way to farm and residue was for the lazy farmers. So I guess everything comes full term eventually. Well, I want to thank you too for uh, hosting this virtual cover crop field day so that we could still see some green in the field because it really does make us all uh, feel good to see that green. I wanna wish you luck with spring planting. Um, and I just uh, wanna thank you again. So for those on the, on the Facebook Live, thanks for sticking with us this first time around. Um, we'll be hosting a lot more virtual cover crop meetups this summer. And if, if Practical Farmers of Iowa is new to you, um, we hope that you'll come back to our Facebook page or to our website and learn more about all the different programming that we're offering. Um, and so Maggie, if you could go to the, the cost share slide one more time. And so for those that haven't gotten started yet with cover crops, um, or if you uh, think you're eligible, you know, we would love to have you sign up for the cost share. That's what this is for, to help folks get started with expanding their operations with cover crops, to try to make good on a lot of those benefits that the Jacksons are seeing, like planting on time when it's wet, um, getting some weed control um, and, you know, maybe just seeing green after a winter uh, that is sometimes dreary in the spring can get our hearts uh, ready to go and get set for planting. So thanks again for joining us today. Um, and with that, we hope you all have uh, good spring planting conditions and that you'll join us again. Have a good year. Be Bye. safe, everybody. Bye-bye. We're good. Nice job. We're good? Yep. Can you hear us, Mike? I think he left. Oh, shoot. Okay. I was just going to, I mean, we were up to 92 at some point. It's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. That was great. Yep. I feel like the next one will be even smoother. It's too bad that uh, it was like a little more windy and then the sun wasn't as nice. Oh, there's Mike. There we <laughs> go. Yeah. Now the sun comes out after the sun is out now that it's over. <sighs> so we had up to 92 and we maintained like 78 to 80 the whole time. That was great. Oh, that's yeah. got to be a record. That's a record for us. <laughs> that's a record for us too. <laughs> <laughs>